Thanks so much, Joey. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship. Uh, rich singing, rich lyrics, rich music. Thank you. Well, this is our last uh, chapel gathering, uh, last day of classes, and, uh, and I, uh, I just want you to know I look forward to Wednesday mornings. It's a highlight of my week, and, uh, and I want to turn our attention uh, to God's Word now, but I want to uh, conclude with uh, a bit of an encouragement to you, a bit of a, a blessing on you, because uh, this is, this is uh, in many ways, our last gathering all together like this. And so, uh, welcome to chapel this morning. I want you to turn to the book of Acts. If you're still there in chapter 2, turn to chapter 1. And we're actually going to look at a number of passages or a number of chapters here in the book of Acts this morning and, uh, and see what God has for us today. The context is absolutely perfect to the time of year we're in. Last week we just remembered with great solemnity and sobriety incredible sacrifice of the Lord Jesus on the cross. And then we celebrated the triumph of resurrection, improving and validating not only his identity, but his victory over death and the curse of that. And so Easter, deeply significant time, and as we look at Acts chapter 1, this is, again, right after that experience of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And Christ has visited his disciples a number of times, and now he's about to ascend to be with the Father. And he has a parting conversation with friends that he deeply loves. And in chapter 1, verse 7, he says this, He said to them, now let me back up to verse 6, And when they come together, they ask him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? I, I, I'm curious with this question. See, they've been waiting for a physical kingdom. They've been waiting for that launch, that inauguration. They've been waiting for him to be established as king. And I like what Jesus says. I'm intrigued by what Jesus says. He says, he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Very curious. I don't want to draw too much from an argument of silence, but he doesn't say, oh, no, no, guys, there's, there's no kingdom. Nor does he say it's c- completely here in all its fullness. I think his answer points us to that sort of now, not yet thought of the kingdom. He, he says, don't worry about when that kingdom comes in all of its fullness. God will set his agenda by his authority. Rather, You need to be about something else. And he says in verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. He says you're going to receive power. Power is coming. Power from on high. Power of the Holy Spirit. And you will be given the mandate to be my witnesses. Legally, personally, just tell what you've experienced. Tell your story. Tell my story. Just tell the truth. And then he ascends. Peter's a little bit perplexed as to what to do. So in verse 15 we read, In those days Peter stood among the brothers. A company of persons was in all about 120 and said, and he Tells him, well, I guess, guys, we should appoint a a new disciple, a new apostle, because, well, Judas has betrayed us and now committed suicide. I suppose we need a 12th. And perhaps not knowing what else to do, he gives leadership and he establishes a 12th. While this group of 120 people, still reeling in the perplexities of what had happened in recent weeks, and they wait. And in chapter 2... Pentecost, the Spirit comes in power, in supernatural manifestation. And Peter, Peter preaches a sermon like he's never preached before. And verse 14 says, But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. And he preaches the gospel. Scroll down to verse 36. He says this, Let 
Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, that is Jesus, both Lord and Christ, Messiah. This, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. Turn around, change your minds. Change your heart. Change the direction, the trajectory of your life. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, just like we have. The promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. This was supernatural. This was revival. This was renewal. This was, this was God at work in these early days of the church. And then Joey read for us that wonderful passage that describes everything that's good about the local church. We see that there was worship. There was prayer. There was breaking of bread There was instruction and discipleship because they gathered around the apostles' teachings. There was friendship. There was relationship. Relationship mattered because there was fellowship. There was good stewardship and there was generosity because they were sharing their possessions with each other. And there was continual evangelism taking place because as you look at the end of chapter 2, it says, And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The church kept growing. And in chapter 3, Peter is used by God to heal a man who is disabled. And then the persecution begins. And it begins not too intense, but as the book of Acts unfolds, that intensity intensity, uh, certainly becomes more real and more strong and more destructive. In chapter 4, they're called before the council. In chapter 4, verse 4, we read these words. But many of those who, well, back up to verse 3. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. So here, Peter continues to preach. He continues to speak boldly. He continues to give witness and testimony. And now, 5,000 men have come to faith. Was this a male audience? Maybe. More likely it was representative of of homes and households. So in all likelihood it wasn't 5,000, it was probably 10, 12, 15,000. They appear before this council and look at their boldness. Verse 18, so they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. They wanted to shut this enterprise down. But Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. We are bearing witness. It's what we saw, what we experienced. This is our story. And we cannot be silent. We can either listen to you or God. You tell us what we should do. We're listening to God. They pray. Look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they had gathered together was shaken, and they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they continue to speak the word of God with boldness. Chapter 5, an interesting thing takes place with Ananias and Sapphira, where a virus occurs in the, in the body in, in these early stages. And God himself excises this virus. Verse 12, and now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of them risked, none of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. The church just keeps on growing. They were one, And they were massive. And God was there. Now when you bring a lot of people together and you have this kind of phenomenal growth in such a short period of time, 
problems are, are absolutely bound to take place. And that's what happens in chapter 6. A problem ensues. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Now, in those days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists, Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. They had a food pantry. And the, the Greek-speaking widows from the diaspora were, were somehow being neglected, whether they weren't standing in the right line or whether there was more intentional uh, uh, favoritism being shown. But at any rate, the Greek-speaking widows were being ignored, and the Hebrew-speaking widows were the first to get food. And the early, leader, early church leaders very quickly acknowledged that this was a dilemma. This was, this was something that had to be corrected swiftly. In verse 2 it says, And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. They knew their priority, but they also knew they needed more ministry leaders. They needed more servants. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we'll devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And so, so the process they worked through, whatever that process was, was both leader-led and congregational affirmed. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenius, Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. These they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid hands on them. And here would have taken place, there was rapid growth, but there was not an infrastructure to keep up with it. There was more ministry needs, but not enough ministry workers. And so they had to train, equip, empower, deputize, delegate more leaders to solve this problem that could have become hugely dividing, hugely divisive. This could have brought the whole enterprise to a screeching halt. But they faced the problem and they fixed it. And you could spend more time in this, this chapter here because some fascinating observations to, to see how the church problem solved so swiftly. I want you to look at verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. The church continued to grow. 15, 18,000, 20,000, perhaps more. We don't know how big it was, but the first church, the early church was huge. And this isn't about numbers. We know they also met from house to house. They met in homes as well. But you see the phenomenal growth. There was another 20,000 people in heaven because of what took place in these early months of the church. God was at work in powerful, demonstrative, supernatural ways. And if there's any church season in the New Testament, we should be trying to emulate it. It's this season, certainly. You see, you and I are part of something bigger. You and I are, you and I are part of something grand. You and I are part of of the work of God. And I want to draw just for a few moments some, some real critical, foundational, basic observations from just these early chapters of the book of Acts. You see here, they had the power of God. They were appropriating the very power of God by faith. Jesus said to them, Weeks before, I'm leaving you. I'm physically leaving you. And they continued to struggle with the implications of what that meant. But he said to them, I'm not leaving you alone though. I'm leaving you a comforter. I'm leaving you a helper. I'm leaving you the Holy Spirit and he will be in you and he will strengthen you and he will empower you and he will give you the words to say. And so don't be afraid. And so here, when he said, you'll receive power, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, the Spirit came. And now the Spirit came, not just for a season as in the Old Testament, but now he would come and baptize every believer into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 tells us that. Now we're indwelt by the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 tells us. We're, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives inside of us. 
But I think perhaps with most insight, Ephesians 4, 5, 18 says, says this. Don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. But Ephesians 5, 18 says, we need to be filled with the Spirit. This is an imperative. And imperatives, commands can be obeyed, and by implication, commands can be disregarded. Be filled with the Spirit. And, and this whole filling is in juxtaposition to, to wine. What does wine do? It control? It's an elixir that controls us. And so Paul here is saying, don't, don't be controlled by an elixir. Don't, don't be controlled by some sort of external stuff. Be controlled by God. And so when you and I yield, he empowers. And when you and I submit, he strengthens. And when you and I defer, he's glorified. And the early church had the power of God because they had the Holy Spirit inside them and you and I are part of something grand. You you and I have this same Holy Spirit living inside of us. Now the early church had something else. They were passionate witnesses. They were absolutely gripped by the unwavering commitment to the message of Christ to the gospel message, the good news. They were gripped by the words of Jesus and the great commandment. They loved God and they loved each other and they were gripped by the command of Jesus in those final words recorded for us in Matthew 28. Make disciples, more disciples, better disciples. Just keep making disciples. They were passionate witnesses, and their witness was bold, and it was fearless, it was forward-looking, it was visionary, it was full of confidence, and it was full of faith. And they witnessed with their mouths, and they witnessed with their worship, and, and they witnessed with their courage, and they witnessed with their new lifestyle, their morality, and they lift, witnessed with their faith. They bore witness to what they had experienced when the grace of God blasted into their experience and into their life. And they're passionate witnesses. And they they just told others about what they'd seen and heard, what they experienced. Last week, my wife and I were in Abbotsford. And we were in the hospital uh, hospital lobby where there was a Starbucks. We were up uh, through the night. Our daughter had just had uh, her first baby. And so we were having a Starbucks coffee. And there was nobody else in this small Starbucks, and we heard the three employees talking. They were talking quite loud, and three young adults talking about sex. No surprise there. They were talking about sex, and then, we couldn't help but hear because they were so, quite frankly, loud, and then we heard one of these young adults say, I view sexuality as a gift. Something that, that I'm gonna save for the person I marry. And so, we couldn't help but continue to listen. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> and, and, and this young adult seamlessly transitioned to the weekend it was, Easter. And she shared the gospel. And the other two young adults there engaged. And I so badly wanted to join the conversation, but that wouldn't have been appropriate. (laughs) But she was just bearing witness. And it was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. It's what the early church had. They had the power of God. And they just told everyone what they had seen and heard, what they experienced. And the grace that they had been visited by in their encounter with Jesus. In his redemption and forgiveness of their sins. But there's a third thing we see here in the book of Acts. We see here that they were swift to problem solve. When problems come before us, when barriers come before us, we cannot ignore them. Because they can cause a whole enterprise to come to a screeching halt. And here, this issue between Hellenistic widows and Hebrew-speaking widows, this could have been divisive. 
And although we might attribute it to a, a structural problem, to an infrastructure issue, this had all the potential of dividing the church. And they said, we got to fix this. we got to fix this fast. we got to fix this now because it's the right thing to do. And because we've got some momentum. Because God's at work. And we need to solve this problem now. And they solve it. And the work keeps moving forward. Now, this isn't just the story of Acts chapter 6. In chapter 5, the problem there with Ananias and Sapphira, it's solved by God himself. But as you continue to read through the book of Acts, the church was very acutely aware that they need to be aware of problems and barriers that would, would create an impasse, a virus that could rob them of health, something that would halt their growth, halt their momentum. And so as you see the book of Acts progressing, as you see the history of the church progressing, we see increased boldness. We see increased ministry initiatives. We see increased persecution. And we see increased evangelism. And we see more Gentiles coming to Christ. And what do Jewish leaders do? They get a little concerned. Well, what do we do with all these Gentiles? Do we let them in, really? Remember, the hostility and enmity that existed between Jews and Gentiles for, for so long. Do we... Do we Line them up and have them all circumcised? What, what do we... And Acts 15, I don't think we fully appreciate how critical that chapter in the book of Acts is because in Acts 15, if the church didn't navigate that wisely, prudently, we would have had from its very inception two denominations, the Gentile church and the Jewish church. Jesus, who cried about unity, be one, you're one. Let God unify you. And throughout the book of, throughout the New Testament, we have this emphasis on unity. Well, here it was tested in very real terms. What are we going to do with the Gentiles who are coming to faith? And Acts 15 solved the problem. And what happens? More missionary exploits. The church just keeps moving forward. Now the application here, the transfer principles are, are, are so simple because, because we're a part of something bigger. We're a part of something grand. We're a part of this because you and I are a part of the church. And you and I have that same Holy Spirit. You and I have the same mandate of being witnesses. And you and I will face temptations and roadblocks and barriers, and dilemmas, and problems that we'll have to deal with in order to move forward. So, so let me just bring this a little bit more personal for a few moments. And I know you're heading into exams, and that's your focus, but exams will be done. Next week's graduation... And on Monday, this campus will look considerably different with the college now gone. Some of you are graduating. And we pray, graduate, graduate to equip the church and engage the world. To be agents of change. To be influencers of salt and light in the world that God places you, wherever that is. And as you go, remember... You have the power of God. Believe it. Remember you're a witness. Tell your story. And when problems come into your life, they might be structural, they may be organizational, they could be personal. Listen to what the scripture says in Psalms 66 verse 18. Where it says, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened when there are barriers in our life, it halts growth. And when we cherish sin in our lives, it halts our, our growth relationship with God. It impacts us. So deal, face those problems head on. Face those temptations. Face those vices. Face those structural dilemmas as best you can with the wisdom of God and the guidance of the Spirit and the biblical principles we have and equip the church and engage the world. Some of you are finishing up and you're planning coming back. Some of you are finishing up and you're, you're moving into a, a different season, a different school, different work setting, different career context, whatever it may be. Same mandate. 
But let me say, some of you, <clears throat> some of you are planning on finishing up. And I'm just going to be really bold here. Some of you need to come back. The work of transformation in this season of your life is still pretty soft concrete. And one year's good. And two years is good. And three and four years is certainly better. You see, more of you need to give serious thought to vocational ministry. There's more pastors in here and worship leaders and evangelists, and missionaries. And some of you, with the career aspirations that you have, with the marketplace context that you aspire to, to find yourself in, you need to ensure that that foundation is strong and is resilient. And so let me be bold. Some of you, I pray, would consider coming back. Many of you, are finishing up and are planning to come back. But the mandate's the same. When you go home, you have the, pure, the power of God. You're a witness. And there will be dilemmas and problems and barriers that surface in your life. Fix them. Because we're part of something, something bigger. Last week I, I, I shared with you, we were in British Columbia and our daughter had her first child, our first grandchild. I can show you the picture, but no jokes about rocking chairs, please. But as I held that little guy, I felt such love, and I was transported back to when I first held my own daughter and son. And yet also, when I was holding that little guy, I was, I was, I, I was gripped with the weightiness I felt for my daughter and son-in-law, because they now have the stewardship of raising this little life. It's an incredible responsibility. And they'll need the wisdom of God. And then I thought of what we do here. This place is stewarding a season of your life. And we take that stewardship very seriously. See, we love Jesus, we love the work we do, and we love you, and we want the best for you, and, and we want to pour our energy and our time and our role modeling and our work and our energy and our love into you, into this formative season of your life, so that you become partners in this great work of the church because you see we're all part of something grand I'd like to invite you to stand as I pray for you Father in heaven thank you for every student here whether it's college or the high school or the seminary Father, the three schools here at Briarcrest exist to help shape lives that reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, as particularly the college enters into this final week of concluding their studies, whether they're graduating, whether they're completing their season here, or whether they've just completed this year and are planning to return next year, I pray that you would allow us to finish well, to finish strong, but to not lose sight that we are part of something so much bigger than what's taking place here in Kernport. We are a part of a global movement that has been going on for 2,000 years as we herald and discharge the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Would you, would you grip us with the wonder of that responsibility? But thank you that we are not alone. You are with us. 
would you now, we humbly pray, use us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your heart and establish them in every good work and word. Amen. Uh, just one quick announcement for you. I, I had mentioned a, a couple of weeks ago that Young Life in Ontario is looking for 30 interns uh, to work with them in this coming season. Um, Brent Klink will be on campus on April 13th, and he's going to be holding an informational meeting at 3 p.m. in Rymer Hall. Think about this for a minute. Are you interested? If so, you need to pull out your phone and you need to put 3 p.m. Rymer Hall uh, on April 13th in there, okay? Friends, God has been faithful uh, to meet with us here in this place this year. Let us not soon forget what he has done in us. Now go in peace, in the peace and the power of the Holy Spirit to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.